Matthew, Ms. Simon? I'm here. Ms. Russo? Here. Mr. Murphy? Present. Uh, Mr. Nelson is not here at the moment. Ms. Monaco is here. Um, okay, um, I have to read this uh, stuff. Pursuant to, the gov to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, DL chapter 30A, section 20, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the school committee is being conducted via, via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public would be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to or view this meeting while in progress may do so by tuning into the BCAT Government Cable Access Channel, the BCAT Government Meetings Facebook Live feed, or over the phone at 408-418-9388, meeting number 714-037-944. Password is Tuesday. <laughs> What's so funny? Um, okay, the first order of business is the approval of the warrant. So moved. Oh, so moved. Um, I don't think we had a warrant this week. Um, it's on the agenda. I know it's on the agenda, but we got an email from uh, Sharon. Can you speak to this? I thought you said there wouldn't there be. There is no warrant tonight. Oh. Okay. So uh, we won't approve the warrant since there isn't one. Um, okay, <laughs> moving on. Approval of the minutes of 4-28-2020. We motion to approve. Second. <laughs> So moved and seconded to approve the minutes of 428-2020. Any question or comment? All those in favor? Ms. Simon? Aye. Mrs. Russo? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Chairman votes aye. <laughs> Approval of the minutes of 512-2020. Motion to approve. Second. So moved and seconded to approve the minutes of 512-2020. Any question <laughs> comment? All in favor, Ms. Simon? Aye. Mrs. Russo? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Chairman votes aye. We have four, zero, zero. Okay, public participation. Is there anyone here for something that is not on the agenda? If there is, let me know by either speaking up or putting your name in the chat. Uh, all right, I don't see anyone here for public participation. So I actually Ms. Chris uh, I a quick question. Yes. Yeah. Who is that? Oh, Liz DiTucci, okay, go ahead. Yeah, just a super quick one. I was just wondering if um, meeting minutes are being posted somewhere. I went to look and saw ones back from February. I didn't know if those get posted somewhere else or if there's a place I can see them. Sharon, can you tell us where they get posted after we approve them? They are sent to the town clerk. However, I'm not in the office, so I can't sign them. So I've held on to them till I can sign them and I will send them on to the town clerk, but they are approved. Okay, so as as we can get them out, they will show where. Where is the? Uh... It's on the town clerk's website, and okay. it is under um, departments on the school committee, and it will have um, a section that says meeting minutes and agendas. Okay, does that answer your question, Liz? Yeah, no, thank you. I know where they are. I just hadn't seen them posted, but if it's just because folks aren't in the office, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask a question? Um, I thought we also had access to them through the uh, school department website. Is that, is there a link for that or no? I see Mr. Larkin shaking his head no. 
Is there a way to get to the minutes through our school committee uh, drop down menu? Or if there isn't, is that something that when things are being done on the website, we could connect them? Would, oh, I, you're muted, Mr. Larkin, but I see you shaking. Yes, thank you. Thanks, okay. And it Okay, did you get your answer, Martha? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is update from the superintendent on the uh, coronavirus uh, life as we've come to know it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just before I, I get to that, I do want to, um, just take a moment of gratitude and uh, thank Kristen Russo for her service. I believe this is her last um, meeting with us. Kristen, it's been, I believe, nine years. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. So uh, thank you so much. You've been uh, just an incredible contributor and you've made the committee as a whole much better. So, um, so thank you before we jump into the agenda. But uh, I just wanted to not start without acknowledging um, all the hundreds of hours that you've put into um, community service and your service on the committee. So thank you. Thank you. Eric, before you go on, <clears throat> Kristen, we're all looking forward to that drink. <laughs> yeah. And, and we, will, we will miss you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor to serve Burlington and serve the children and to work with such wonderful people who at the bottom of their heart have the best interest of all the children put together in there. It's, it's really been a pleasure. I've been on different boards in different towns. And um, if you give me a second, can I just say a couple things? Go ahead. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know, being a teacher, I go out a lot into the education field, do different things. And, and I don't think we realize how much Burlington, the work of our administrators and teachers is really celebrated and modeled outside. Um, for example, my professional development class in the town I teach in focused on social media. The first chapter in that book highlighted a child from Burlington, a graduate, the work they were doing with technology in Burlington. I was at a Mass Association School Committee and Dr. Conti was lauded in the RTI program that we have here in Burlington is a a model for the state and, and really highly thought of. Um, to last week, actually, I was on a universal design for learning with two instructors who are highly respected in the area. And 20 minutes in, Patrick Larkin is recognized, the work in Burlington, and there were over 330 something participants in it. So. I, I don't think we realize just how much Burlington is recognized in the work because I don't wanna say we take it for granted, but we see a need and we try and meet that need fiscally responsible in the best way we can for those children. So it, it almost is just a day-to-day -day thing and and I appreciate it. And I don't, and I have the feeling there are other boards in town like police or Board of Health that this is also occurring that, again, until we go outside the town, we might not see it. So I just want to thank all the boards, Mr. Sagarino, you know, you know, and all the con conversations we've had throughout the years, because those conversations um, are, are really what makes us grow, makes us stronger, and makes Burlington who we are. And you know we're not pitting students against students and programs against programs because of our accommodated budget. And to me, it just says love to our children. And 
you don't realize unless you've been in another town to hear those heart wrenching conversations and statements, putting a program against another or a child against another. So again, I, I can't thank you enough for the professionalism and respect and, and just love for doing what's right for our children as a teacher, as a parent, and now as a almost former school committee member. So thank you. Well, thank you, Kristen. You certainly have been a part of all that great work. Does anyone? Oh, and thank you, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any other comments? I just want to say thank you as well. I won't go into a lot of details, but thank you for all that you've given to the school district and shared with me and you've been a supportive colleague and all. So thank you. And, and Diane Creeden typed a note. Thank you. Appreciate your conscientious dedication for our school system. Okay, before we all get teary eyed, um, shall we move on? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, Madam Chair, um, since our last meeting, um, we've um, um, partnered with a, a company called Panorama. They're a survey company. Uh, we had initially, um, our partnership was going to be on an equity survey that was going to take place um, right before the, um, the buildings were closed. Um, Panorama uh, does this work um, all over the country, and they're uh, a well-respected um, survey group. And um, obviously, their work has shifted to, um, they've been doing, getting a lot of feedback for communities on uh, the remote learning planning that they've been doing. So we partnered with them. Um, they helped us uh, put together a survey, shape the questions. Um, and we administered uh, that survey and we have some of the results to go over with the, the uh, committee now. Um, we just started to um, go through the results uh, today. So um, this is really gonna be, as the agenda says, a um, preliminary look, um, but I think um, this information is going to um, help us as we prepare for the fall. And this isn't gonna be the last survey that we, um, that we have to do. So uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about it after we go through the results, but we wanna get feedback directly from students. We wanna get feedback uh, from teachers. And uh, there might be other things that we need to do during the summer for parents, um, asking parents, uh, for instance, um, um, would they even use a bus if we made it available, for instance, um, might be information that we need to have um, as we look for ways to, um, manage our costs or negotiate with some some a vendor like our transportation company. So I just think um, this was, a, again, a first survey. It's certainly not going to be our last survey. And um, and I think it's always important that we get input from uh, people as we go through this, um, the, the, the new process we're going through. So um, Patrick, you um, had some slides that we worked on today. Yes, I think uh, I sent them to Bob earlier, so hopefully you can call them up. And again, um, it's just an initial look at some of the feedback. We have uh, 759 responses as of the time that um, I started to put these slides together. We're gonna keep this survey open until um, the end of the day, Thursday, so five or six o'clock at night. Um, we'll shut this survey down for good. Um, but right now we're approaching 25% response rate which um, according to, again, um, Panorama works with over 900 districts across the country to do various surveys, social emotional learning, equity surveys, um, pretty much meets the needs of whatever they, um, whatever district wants to survey um, their stakeholders in. So it was great to work with them on this. Um, they're out of Boston, I believe, Dr. Conti, if I'm not mistaken. And, yes. Uh, yeah. So again, I just wanted to uh, go over some pre preliminary results Please ask follow-up questions. Um, I'll answer what I can, um, but it's a it's an initial dive into what we got, and um, it's just the start of the conversation because we've tried to be clear with people uh, that it seems pretty clear that we're going to have some type of remote learning in the fall, whether it's for some students, for all students. Um, 
we're gonna we're gonna be in this mode in some regard. It seems like in the fall. I hope we're not, but um, it seems pretty clear that we might be. So um, it's really important that we get as many people that want to give feedback to us, families at home. Um, we're working on teacher and and student surveys to go out by the end of the week as well. So we have all of our stakeholders covered. So um, this is just the pre preliminary results. So Bob, you can go to the next slide. All right, so the first question was, are you clear on the remote learning plan expectations for your child? Now, the way Panorama sets up their questions is there's a favorability response. So anything in the green is considered favorable and yellow or red would be um, more of a negative response. So again, I wanna preface this whole presentation with the fact, and I don't, I don't mean to be condescending to anyone, but uh, I heard a podcast this weekend that was looking at all the different options for what could happen in the fall if we don't go back. And just to remember that this started March 13th, is um, Friday the 13th was our first day where we didn't have kids and we had the rug pulled out from under us and nobody had prepared for anything like this. Um, we, we, we couldn't see this coming and there's nothing we can do remotely that is gonna replicate what our teachers do in the classroom with the kids, especially the younger kids, the K one, two, three kids. You cannot replicate some of the early literacy, numeracy, teaching that goes on in those classrooms. Um, so again, sorry to um, digress. Are you clear on the remote learning plans expectations for your child? Again, 600 respondents said yes, 21% um, said no. I'm kind of looking at this um, as a grade I would get in class, a 79% would be um, almost above average, but it's pretty average. Are we happy with it? Uh, we're not happy with anything right now. Um, are we satisfied? I would say yes, but if we got this response in the fall um, where we can see what's ahead of us, we would not be satisfied at all. So um, we have some work to do. We're clear on that. Uh, Bob, if you want to go to the next slide, it gives a breakdown um, across the grades of how people responded. So with each of these questions, you can see um, that 79% was overall pre-K to 12, that includes the Burlington Early Childhood Center, through seniors, how people responded that responded to the, um, to the survey so far. So you can see some blips like, you know, the clarity levels, they're all in the 70s for this question. So they're all um, relatively positive um, responses in regard, you can see some little dips and it's interesting. And um, there are some questions that aren't, necessarily able to be judged on. We had some open-ended questions that I'll talk about um, at the end, like that you can't measure in this regard, which I think are gonna give us a lot more feedback. Um, Bob, go to the next slide, please. So um, the next question is, to what degree have the materials posted online for students or provided by teachers been helpful? And again, the overall in the positive is somewhat or extremely helpful um, you can do the math, it's 81%, I believe, uh, is in the green, and then slightly helpful, 16%, not at all helpful, is, is 3% of the respondents so far. And if you go to the next slide, we can see that breakdown again from pre-K to 12. Um, I think we're gonna see some trends here, and I don't wanna, I'll, I'll try to save it for the last time we get to this um, kind of grid pre-K to 12 to, to give my feedback, but, You'll notice um, it's very low at pre-K. Um, interestingly, it takes a big jump at K. Uh, and then there's some other dips, but again, these were all about 70% or above. The pre-K was a little bit lower. Um, Bob, the next slide, please. Describe your child's overall experience with distance learning. Again, 76% are either engaged or highly engaged and 24%, um, 178 respondents, again, pre-K to 12. We could break that down and we can dive into that within the panorama instrument itself to see how many parents at each grade level said that they were not engaged. So we will be doing that with principals um, at each school too to see if there's any outlying um, statistics here. But overall, again, 
um, we're 76%, which I don't want to say we're satisfied with anything. I know I said that earlier, but um, again, building the plane while we're flying it, uh, it's not the worst case scenario. Um, and I also want to say um, that our teachers are working extremely hard. And, and we saw that in a lot of the um, anecdotal responses from staff. So none of the reflection here um, is on teachers. Uh, their efforts are 100% in the green from my regard. But anyway, next slide, Bob. So again, you see these blips, it's really interesting. And part of it is the number of respondents in some areas is lower, but obviously we have a dip in grade 10, which we'll be, we'll be diving into the high school. Um, one of the other things we've started to do um, is reach out to, to parents at different grade levels and, and talk to them to get their responses for how it's been going from the students. But overall, we're 60% or above. Um, the grade 10 is an interesting um, dip right now, which we, we really don't have a response for. We can't describe like why that is so low at that at grade 10. Uh, so that's something we'll be looking into. Next slide. Thank you. Um, do you feel the amount of work your child has received during distance learning has been appropriate, insufficient, or too much? So insufficient or too much were both deemed negative responses by the, by the tool that we utilized. So 61% felt like it was just right, and about 20% either thought it was too much or not enough work. So um, we're gonna have to find that balance, again, if we're gonna be moving in this direction, moving forward. And Bob, if you go to the next slide, that'll show us, again, the K to 12 results. Interestingly, where we see the pre-K um, low in some questions, they, they were the highest in regards to, they got the appropriate amount of work. Um, so there's some interesting contradictions here as we start to dig into this data. And again, you'll see we're above 60 across, well, 10 might again be a little bit below that, but we're above 60 uh, pretty much across the board, uh, which again, we will be getting more information as we look at the, um, we have a spreadsheet with all of the individual responses about what would people change, um, what's working and what's not working. There's a lot of great feedback from families that we're gonna be digging through um, as far with our administrative team in the upcoming days. Next one, Bob. Um, the work my child is getting through distance learning is manageable for me as a parent. This one's really important and I wanna um, talk about how this question was set up. So yes, um, a yes answer means that's a parent that feels like they need to support their student. That second green line at the bottom, 24%, which I think when we look at the um, grid, the next slide, you'll see kind of an increase from grade five and above where we would expect students to be more self-directed so the parents didn't have to sit by their child's side. Um, the no responses, I believe we're gonna see um, lower blue lines when we look K, one, two, three, because let's face it, um, we've a lot of us have had little kids at home. I know I have. And, depending on their age level, you need to sit with them and support them in their homework a little bit more. So for our youngest students, our parents are becoming de facto teachers at this point. That's not an offense to our teachers. Um, they're doing the best they can remotely, but for, get to work, for work to get accomplished, the students, the parents need to sit by the student's side to make sure they get it done. So, um, Go to the next slide and I think we'll see that more clearly, Bob. So if you look, again, grades five, again, there's a little blip in seven, we can investigate that, but they're more self-directed from grade five and above. And you can see pre-K, one, two, three, four even, um, where parents are really feeling the burden. Um, and this is not a Burlington issue. This is a, a issue across the country from forums I've been involved in, from reading feedback from different school districts. It's a struggle for families to have to sit there with their kids and support them in this work. Many of our parents are working from home. This is a huge problem and this is something that's gonna be a big part of our planning as we look to the fall. How can we take this burden off families? Because it's not good for the student, it's not good for the parent, 
how can we provide more work um, from the district level that's not gonna put such a burden on the parents. Um, next slide, Bob. That's it, okay. Um, there's one question that was at the end of the survey um, and, and it was interesting to me, it's not in the presentation because it didn't have that green or uh, yellow, red, like favorable, non-favorable. But the question is, which of the following improvements would you most like to see your school make during remote learning? And the possible answers were, provide more guidance to me on student learning, so that's for the parent. 46% said they would like more guidance for them on student learning. 14% um, of the parents said they would like more technology assistance. 22% said they would like fewer assignments. 17% said they would like more assignments. So that goes kind of back to that previous question where parents, did we send too much or not enough work? But I think one of the things we clearly underestimated as a school district was how much support the parents need with the technology. Like we're comfortable with the tools that we're using from a school standpoint, but I'm not sure it was as clear as we thought it was for parents to access, whether it's through Seesaw for elementary, whether it's through Google Classroom. I think one of our, um, again, if we know we're gonna be in the similar position next year, one of our major, major focal points is gonna be providing tutorial work for parents, again, short videos on how they can access what we're doing with the kids. Like, here's how we expect it to look. Here's what you can do to support your student. Here's where you can turn for help quickly if you need it. So some of those safety nets may not have been in place. And I think um, I've heard it from a few people I've talked to. Um, I've been speaking to different stakeholders in Burlington is that um, we overestimated the adult's ability with technology. So that's something that we're gonna to try to do a better job of. So again, that's, that's a very quick overview of um, some of the data we have. We could spend um, an hour on this presentation. Um, we can come back to this next time if you would like. There's a lot more um, here, especially if we have a couple more days where it's open. If people are watching here, or if people are speaking to um, fellow parents in Burlington, please encourage them to, to fill out this survey if they haven't yet. As many voices as we can get back on this, it's gonna help us plan for the future. So if they, it should be in their email. It came from Panorama. Um, the, there's a blog post on our BPS website that talks, that shows you the email address that you would have gotten this email from if it ended up in a spam folder. Um, if you can't find that, there's also a link for you to fill out the survey as a parent right directly from our website. So the more feedback we can get, um, the better it's gonna allow us to prepare for the fall. I hope we don't have to prepare for remote learning. That would be the best case scenario, but we're moving forward um, in the mindset that there's gonna be some type of blended experience for our kids in the fall. And uh, I'll leave it for questions now, follow-up questions from that brief survey. Okay, um, committee members have questions or comments? Mr. Murphy. Um, no questions, the only comment is obviously it's really interesting to start to get some feedback on some of the stuff. Um, and I look forward to getting more and, and analyzing it more thoroughly. Uh, the more we find out about that, the better we can be prepared for the fall if, if we have to go in that direction. So I appreciate Patrick for, for affiliating us with this, um, this outfit and hopefully we'll get some useful information out of it. Uh, Martha, do you have comments? Uh, yeah, I wanna say, I think this is useful for us to get a sense. And I actually decided to do my own neighborhood survey anecdotally this week. In, I've been going out walking in my neighborhood, so I'm getting to know a lot of my neighbors. Um, and it, it kind of matches what I heard from parents, whether they were elementary parents or high school parents, if they were parents of children who were more independent or parents of children who needed more pushing, it, it really does match the anecdotal stories I heard from parents in my neighborhood. So, but it is good to have this information. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, do you have input? 
No, I'm just appreciative that we have this first survey. So moving forward, you'll be able to see the trends and where the improvements can be made. So thank you. Uh, Steve, are you on? I am, Chris, finally, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank Patrick for the presentation. I think it was well done. I was uh, encouraged by the results of the survey. I was surprised that there were as many uh, positive uh, comments in the survey as, as we saw. I think we've all been hearing from many people in the community uh, about how they're struggling. And um, I think Patrick identified ways that we can address that. I think it's, uh, it's, it's good to know that we need to help parents more uh, to get everybody uh, going where they need to go. And um, I, I, I still worry about students with special needs and this, the English language learners and whether we're reaching them. Uh, some of the kids were not really engaged as we saw from that survey. And that's my, probably my biggest concern. Okay, I have a, I have a few comments um, myself. Um, I, I think I would like to see more people respond to the survey um, so that we can get a broader perspective. Um, I think that the, the biggest issue that I'm hearing is uh, different amounts of time that students are getting remotely with their teachers and classmates. I think um, some of them are getting a, a really nice amount and some of them aren't getting as much and it's upsetting for some parents. Um, I think it would probably bother me too. Um, I have also heard from parents who feel that they have they feel overwhelmed with the amount of support they have to provide, especially for the younger kids. The older ones are pretty much independently doing their work. Um, these are preliminary results, and I understand that um, hopefully at the next meeting we can have uh, more. Is that accurate, Patrick? We can leave the survey open as long as we want to. Um, I, I just, at some point we wanna close the window. So we will send another reminder email to families to please fill it out. Again, I hope word of mouth from this meeting tonight and social media, please encourage your neighbors to fill it out if they haven't, um, because we wanna have as much feedback as possible. And as much as the um, questions are great, I don't know if we get another 100 or 200, if those percentages will change dramatically but the, um, there's some open-ended questions in the survey as well that I think are really gonna help us a lot to hear individual stories from individual families about how we can best support them. And I understand there will be some other surveys going out also? Yeah, it's imperative. Um, and I think unfortunately uh, we, we wanna have a balance here and not survey people to death, but um, we're gonna have teacher survey, a parent, um, a student survey, in very short order. So for the next meeting, I would think um, we'll have some preliminary results for those. But as if it becomes clearer in mid-June when the Department of Education said they're gonna tell us what the plan for the fall is, if it becomes clear that we are going to be in some type of a remote situation, um, whether it's some kids at school on certain days um, or you know all the kids at home, I hope it's not that certainly, um, we're gonna have some more follow-up questions for parents one of the, again, there's a great podcast. I may, I don't want to overwhelm people with the information, but I think it's important that we start thinking about what lays ahead. Um, there was a great podcast I listened to this weekend that outlaid like seven different options for the fall. And I think one of the important things here is every family is dealing with a different situation at home. Like I had young kids, I have two in college and an eighth grader right now. I can't imagine if they were all in early elementary school and I had to work and also help them support them in their education. I can't imagine how I could do that right now, to be honest with you. So it's almost like an individual plan for um, the podcast. I'm sorry, it's Cult of Pedagogy. Uh, Jennifer Gonzalez is the, um, and I'll put the link on our Facebook page because I think it's good information for people to look at. Um, but we, almost like having an individual plan for different families. Like you could have like, I think six or seven templates of what the plan could look like um, might be a good option because I think um, 
you don't need a hundred options, but there's probably like five or six or seven different family situations um, that we didn't need to take into consideration. So I don't want to get ahead of myself. Hopefully we can all come back together. That would be the best case scenario. But I think we'll know more as the months um, and the weeks go ahead and we see what's happening um, in Massachusetts and beyond. And M Madam Chair, we, we also just need to, some time. So um, um, to look at some individual grades, I think some student profile information came through because we we fed the, the survey data through our student information system. So we might look at different student demographics. Um, there could be a profile of student um, that we need to address some issues with. So I, 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 we're just starting this, as Patrick said, this is the beginning of the conversation, um, but we, we can get a lot more granular um, as, as we move forward. And, and uh, clearly with this first pass, um, one of the things Patrick and I talk about all the time is that if we have to selectively send students back to school, um, it's obvious we should start with the students who can't um, self attend to their schoolwork. So we would, we would, if we were to prioritize um, school attendance, it would be for the, uh, for the younger grades, um, uh, just given some of the feedback that we've gotten. So th that those are the type of things that we're is going to help inform us. But Madam Chair, next meeting, we can certainly um, give you preliminary information on the teachers and students. Um, and we, we can look for more um, granular data on on this particular survey. Okay, Eric, at, on the next agenda, would you please set aside time either at the beginning of the meeting under public participation or as a response time for whatever survey discussion we have um, for community input so that anyone who, anyone who wishes to um, address the whole remote learning aspect, we will have time set aside for them to do so at the next meeting, okay? Thumbs up for Merrick. Okay, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this topic? Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to, this is Martha Simon, I'd like to request that the uh, survey not close on Thursday because I know even when I'm only working a couple hours a day, during the week, it's really hard. I see things and I don't get back to them till the weekend. So I was wondering if we could have it open till like the end Sunday night, till or you know close it Sunday night or Monday morning. Would at least, okay? at least, yeah. Keep it open as long as you can. Thank you. All right, Patrick, you good with that? Yeah, we won't close it. Um, I'm fine with uh, maybe the end of the business day on Monday. There's no, um, especially if we're looking at updating the data for the next school committee meeting, there's no rush to close it. So that's okay. fine with me. Okay, anyone else who wishes to speak to this? Um, I just saw I there's a, Mr. Sinesi asked about, are, is the survey available in other languages for families who don't speak English? Um, it is not currently available. Um, one of the things we are doing is um, reaching out to our ELL families. Uh, I have an ELL team meeting scheduled for Thursday. Um, mm -hmm. So again, it's not a 100% correlation for families that need translations and families that have ELL students, but um, it's a good question because our results are 20% less for um, folks that are not native speakers um, that's one of the things we can drill down to. So it's a good question. Um, it's one of the things that um, we're certainly looking to address is to make sure that these these surveys. So we can we can we are going to translate this and have it um, emailed out to families as well, or um, even mailed to families. So it's something we're working on, but those results would not be in today's numbers. Thank you. We just you have to get it translated into well i mean again i think we're familiar with the fact i think it's over 50 languages that are spoken in burlington that doesn't mean we have to translate all of those so i think right now we're about six that we need to translate it to have you gotten any requests um uh, megan, no, megan we do have we do have student families that have requested translations for anything that goes home so that would be um that's something when when families um do their initials um, registration with the district and they update that every year. 
if they need um, materials that are going home from the school or from the district translated, the mm -hmm. parents um, designate that at, at the beginning of each school year. So and we do have a, a certain number that we need to do that for, yes. Have you gotten any specific requests for translations on this item? Again, the specific requests would not be for this item. They would be the ones that were accountable to translate for anything that goes home. So we already know who those people are. And you're already working on it. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. And it's not just translations. I think in looking at our student lists, because we wanted to make sure we hit every family, uh, Patrick, there are between 35 and 40 families that didn't have email addresses. So um, we, we have to, um, we, we might even have to do some phone interviewing or something. We might have to try to reach out to those families in, in other ways. So the, the survey is only gonna reach uh, so many people. We're gonna really have to try to broaden uh, the support. And I'm sure some of the families who are most in need of our support may have the most difficulty accessing um, a, a survey like this. So we're, we're aware of it. We're just trying to uh, track them down. Um, almost, we're, we are tracking them down individually. And are you, are you still working on um, access for people who don't have it? You know, internet? Uh, um, Bob, how many, Bob would know the answer. How many hotspots have we provided currently for the ones that we're aware of? Again, we've done this at the school level, back to the teacher level. If there's a student that's not connecting, I think we've got it back. Um, we had a spreadsheet going for people that don't have internet and we've provided a number of hotspots. What's our number at, Bob? Nine. nine. So we provided nine hotspots to families um, who did not have internet access that have requested it. Yeah, and, and we're again, we're committed to doing that for more if, um, if we find out there's a need. But I, again, um, we tried to do this at the building level. We asked principals going back to our first couple of weeks of remote learning, if we're not making any contact with students um, from the teacher level, please get that list and let's contact them via phone, find out what the concerns are. And if it's an internet access issue, we were, we were committed to providing hotspots. So right now the number's at nine hotspots that we've provided to individual families. All right, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Um, Oh, there's something written here. So the email announcing the survey has been appropriately translated is a question. Um, I'm not, I don't believe we've sent a translated copy of this email. Again, that's something I talked about today. Um, I had a meeting with my, my, a couple of people on my staff and that's something we're working on right now. Um, again, the initial results of the survey um, that I went over with Panorama this afternoon were, were about 20% um, less response rate on our speakers that may not be native English speakers. So um, not surprising. Uh, again, going back to, I think that is becoming an obvious point for districts across the country. Our um, inequities are being magnified in this time. And mm -hmm. so um, we will make sure that this gets out. And I, again, going back to your point, Madam Chair, is I don't think we should close the survey until we're sure that um, all of our families have gotten a copy that they can access. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Uh, look, keep us informed about the translation and everyone getting it. Will do. Okay, um, Dr. Conti, are you ready to move on? Um, yes, Madam Chair, we're still sort of anxiously awaiting the um, uh, the state guidelines. And again, we're preparing different educational scenarios. And um, I believe I shared the CDC, um, some of the CDC guidelines uh, with the committee early in the week, but um, those actually are changing um, pretty frequently as well. So it really doesn't make sense for us to jump into a bunch of scenarios until the public health experts tell us what the rules are, are going to be. So um, again, when the rules change, we're, we're, we'll have those conversations. Um, obviously the data that we're gathering now, our experience, as Patrick said, this is gonna be a known situation now in the fall. We should be, um, we're starting to have those conversations. 
So I believe we can move on unless there are any other questions. When do you expect to um, get the regulations? I'm hoping uh, the guidelines, what we were told, and the committees I'm sitting on at the state are trying to get this done by um, by mid-June. So I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks we'll have some uh, preliminary guidelines in work because um, it, it can't be the week before school starts. So I, I think um, we're, we're um, it, it's a lot to plan, but I think the uh, commissioner and the uh, state department of public health are really trying to um, get us the information we need. Okay, let us know because we're all sort of on the edges of uh, seats worrying about when we'll know what we're looking at. I've I've well I've gone well past the edge of my seat, so I'm I'm off my feet. So uh, um, we will we will um, share whatever information we have. All right, thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda: communication, school building facilities update. M Madam Chair, um, I see that our the attorney Thayer is here. I wonder if it would be possible to switch the order of the uh, uh, agenda to get to the transportation issue sooner. Eric? Um, That's fine with me. I saw Matt show up, so that would be great. Okay, go ahead. Um, all right, so we're gonna go to um, seven, it looks like the second, second line in communication, school transportation services recommendation. So the committee asked me to make a, um, to go back to Trombley, our transportation provider, and try to, um, see if we could negotiate um, a better deal. We asked uh, KMP to do that for us. Again, Matt had been working with us and giving us guidance. Um, and I'd like to say, and Matt's here, um, Matt, I think um, successfully went back and negotiated a um, an agreement that I, I'm recommending the school committee um, adopt. So with that, Matt, I'll turn it over to you and you can go through the um, go through the specifics. Sure, thank you, Dr. Conti, and, and through you, Madam Chair, to the members. I uh, just wanted to highlight a couple of points here. I know last time when we looked at this, initially the MOU as drafted would have required a 78% reimbursement rate for, you know, commencing upon the effective date of the uh, applicable COVID order that the governor issued back in March through the end of this school year. Um, they have since agreed after conversations I had with John McCarthy directly, the CEO and president of Trombley Motor Coach, uh, who is your vendor, to um, reduce that amount to 48 uh, percent from May 1st through the end of the school year through June. Um, they will maintain the 78 percent rate beginning March, I believe, 16th through April 30th, which was the case already premised upon the prior negotiation, negotiations that took place before KP got involved. Um, so it looks like we have a bifurcated reduction in rate uh, based on the MOU we, we, we subsequently received directly from Trombley. Uh, secondly, um, Mr. McCarthy agreed to a flat CPI adjustment through 2023. In other words, you wouldn't see an increase in CPI through 2023. So that's a um, you know, I think a, a fairly a substantial uh, give on his part. And then finally, we reserve our rights to make further adjustments to the um, underlying contract pursuant to subsequent MOU post June 30th. So July 1st onward, if in fact the COVID orders are still in effect and schools thereby affected um, adversely, then we'll make the appropriate modifications pursuant to a subsequent negotiation directly with Trombley under a new MOU. So in, in sum, um, we were able to get us a 48% uh, rate from May 1st on through fit the end of the fiscal year. Uh, the 78% rate would apply uh, March 16th through April 30th. Uh, we were able to ensure that there be no CPI increase to our rate through 2023 and we reserve our rights to make any further modifications post June 30th, pursuant to a new MOU if necessary. So that's in sum the arrangement we arrived at. And I did forward along to um, Dr. Conti and Nicole a uh, MOU to that effect. 
there's one thing that was not included, which is the CPI freeze, if you will. Um, we'll make sure that's in there based on the verbal agreement that I arrived at with Mr. McCarthy on Thursday afternoon. Okay, thank you. Eric, do you have anything to add before we have open to the committee? Um, no, I I'm, I'm, want to thank uh, KMP. I want to thank Matt and Darren and, uh, and, um, and Nicole for um, really working hard on this. Um, Nicole did a great job. So uh, I'm strongly recommending we take this deal. That's again, 78% from the March 16th through April 30th, and then 48% from May 1st to the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. And then the CPI information that Matt uh, also passed on for future years. Um, again, just one of the things in the back of the, let, let's do that first, and then I'll talk about transportation after June 30th, okay? so. Let's do that uh, okay. so I don't complicate things. So I recommend uh, the committee um, move forward with this um, agreement. Okay, Mr. Nelson, do you have anything to say about this? Steve? He's muted. Steve, are you muted? Oh, well. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, go ahead, Steve. Sorry, Madam Chair. I would like to make a, a motion first that the committee vote to approve the, the MOU uh, as presented tonight with the caveat that we're going to add that CPI language uh, going forward for next year. Okay. And I have a question, Madam Chair. Go ahead. When we were talking uh, at our last meeting about out of district placements, there was a concern about whether or not the town would authorize the payment of those out of district tuitions because we allegedly weren't receiving services. Do we have that same issue with the bus contract or is there something else out there that will uh, make sure that the town agrees to pay these bills even though technically we're not receiving the bus services? Um, Madam Chair, I think Matt, Matt can answer this question as well, but I believe there is legislation passed that allowed um, transportation to be included. Um, transportation bills to be paid, uh, Mr. Nelson, and we're we're trying to get that legislation expanded to um, out of district tuitions. But Matt, I just want to make sure I'm I'm being correct here. Yeah, and the pending legislation you refer to, Dr. Conti, and again through you, Madam Chair, to the members is to answer uh, Mr. Nelson's question. I the, the legislation has been engrossed by the House today. Um, that deals with uh, school contracts specifically, which used to be Senate 62680, now it's House 4752, goes back to the Senate. The Senate would have to concur with the House amendment. House Ways and Means made an amendment to that language, and we're still reviewing that language since it's fresh. Uh, but both branches have engrossed very, uh, two different versions of that bill as of today. Oh, bottom line, if we pass this, will it get paid? Yeah, so uh, through the chair, Christine? Yes, go ahead, Darren. So, you know, we, we took the position really on both issues that um, that we, we did say that 4156 applied to this, you know, part of our, our argument with the bus companies and it's all the bus companies, not just Trombley, is that you know, we don't, we're not required to pay it. Um, the new legislation will give us the right to, but I think even under the current law, let's just say that legislation never passes. I don't think it prohibits you from working out at a fair arrangement. For instance, if you think you're getting a percentage of services, whether it be through your bus contract or whether it is uh, through your out of placement services, you know, aware of the opinion that you can pay it if you feel you're getting fair services. If you're if you're not, and we would take the position as the law stands right now that you don't have to pay it. But, you know, if you're determining that you're 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 paying for a fair sort of share of the services, and the law that we're waiting on will clarify that. But even the law, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. Even in its latest form, it doesn't require payment. It says we can. Pay. That's, that's correct. So Darren's totally correct with that assessment. It, it doesn't change the may to a shall. It remains a may on the part. In other words, it vests discretion with every city, town, and district with respect to whether or not to enter into an alternative arrangement. 
4156. Okay, Mr. Nelson. I think my questions have been answered, Chris. I would uh, I would support the motion, of course. And Mr. Murphy, you must have some input. Um, I'm satisfied with the uh, with with the results, and I uh, thank the, the efforts that were put into to get them to to give a little. Um, the only question that I had: uh, are, they, are we going to have need for bus services during the summer? And if so, where do those services fall into the uh, compensation scale? Um, through Chris. Go ahead. Uh, through the chair, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Murphy, um, we do, we may have need of transportation services during the, during the summer, but that, that's a different bus company. Um, uh, Christensen or Lab, uh, the collaborative provides uh, some of our summer bus transportation for, for students. Okay, so, so we're, we're working with those companies right now. So, so after the uh, close of school, uh, we don't use Trombley again until school starts up in the fall. Um, Bob, I'm going to look to you. I, I thought most of our um, summer transportation is provided by Christensen and by the Lab Collaborative. Uh, that is correct. The way the contract is written is that um, we may use them should we need to, um, but we're not required to use them for those services. Uh, so we have some other um, transportation that we use during the summer. So yes, yeah, so it should not affect the current contract or the pricing that we're discussing now. Thank you. That's all I have. Oh, Kristen. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased with this. I want to thank Nicole, Matt, Darren, and um, Mr. Trombley for this. It, you know, I thought we were sending you into almost an impossible position by sending you back, but it's greatly appreciated. And on both sides, I feel it's much more fair and reasonable at this time. So thank you. Martha? I just want to support what Kristen just said, everything. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll take a vote to approve this. Um, is that, you want the vote tonight, Eric? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so it's been seconded to approve the, what is it? What kind of an agreement? A revised memorandum of agreement. Revised MOA? Yep. The school transportation services. In favor, Ms. Simon? Aye. Ms. Mrs. Russo? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Nelson? Mrs. Monaco votes aye. Okay, we have passed that. Um, you want to? All right. No, I, again, not to complicate things, but I think we're going to have to um, utilize uh, Darren and Matt and K KMP um, this summer. Um, because in the CDC guidelines I sent you, I'm not sure if you remember, they said for school bus um, recommendations or guidelines, they were having one student per seat in every other row. Good so um, with our um, elementary buses now with three kids to a seat, uh, I'm not sure transportation is gonna be something that's even feasible or whether parents would even wanna send their kids in a bus. So we need to have more information, but more than likely we're going to be um, having conversations with Trombley uh, moving into the fall once we have a fall plan in place. So um, um, uh, there's some unknown here, but I what one of the things I liked about this agreement is that it um, it allows us to continue to negotiate um, after this fiscal year. Okay, Eric, <clears throat> while we're on this subject, uh, it's closely related to the out of district payments. Would you just um, go over what's happening with that because people are asking me there's some um, cpac members who are very concerned and they are um they're asking me to get to get it um discussed um sure well again the payments have not been made so i'll say that the payments have not been made yet but the progress that have been made is um Mary Hood and her staff have gone through and gotten the remote learning plans from every school that was provided. So I think Darren's point um, last meeting was if we are receiving a service, then we need to make that case. So we got the um, evidence of the services that we were receiving. 
um, as sort of step one. I also spoke with Ken Gordon, our representative, uh, two or three times, and he is um, helping push along the legislation that um, Darren and Matt mentioned. So I think that's another front that we need to do. And I just need to set up a time to um, go through the um, the remote learning plans from each of these schools and to look at if there's um, any area that they're not providing that we are paying for and um, trying to give a concrete example. I think one of the ones that we've discussed that uh, Nicole um, brings up is, is like a, um, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll let Nicole talk in a second. She's correcting me, which is great. Um, so, um, but we're, we're collecting evidence and we're moving forward. So, Nicole, you said, um, um, why don't you correct me, please? Go ahead, Nicole. Uh, so, as of the last school committee meeting, um, when the committee voted that um, they wanted to issue the payments for um, for their tuitions, um, we did begin processing those invoices. Um, we're still we're still reviewing um, the additional services like the one to ones um, and all of those other things to make sure that those services are being provided um, <clears throat> before we're paying those uh, as Dr. Conti mentioned. So some things are still still being reviewed, but the, the students will not be losing their placements. Okay, so a lot of the um, placements, the the bills are being paid. Maybe not some of the details like the extras, the one to ones, et cetera and we will not lose placements. Is that That's all correct? correct? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, maybe you could, um, Nicole, maybe you could send us some sort of a, a memo and update us on that since it uh, seems like word didn't get out. Okay, Eric, you got anything else? Hey, well, Darren's still here. Is Darren still here? Here. Darren, uh, just uh, Madam Chair, if we wouldn't mind jumping around, I just, uh, Darren and I um, uh, put together a, a memorandum of agreement of one year for uh, Unit D, um, which are um, high school department heads, team chairs, um, I think elementary, um, our elementary assistant principal. Um, and again, it's basically the same. Um, uh, memorandum of agreement as with unit A, which was a two and a half percent Darren cost of living increase with a commitment to begin bargaining um, next fall. Is that is that correct? Th that's accurate. Yep, that sums it up. Um, okay, I want to I want the committee to ask questions on this. Uh, at first, I, I have one question. I don't want to wait on it. And, I have a concern that when we make these agreements, we lose our ability to negotiate things like remote learning. And I, I don't want that to happen. We can't wait a whole year to get remote learning negotiated. So what's the status on that? Um, the status is the state is really establishing the guidelines for the teaching. And we will, um, once the state establishes those guidelines, we will go back and if there's a change in working conditions, which is sort of a silly thing to ask, because obviously there's a change in working conditions, then we would go back and have those conversations uh, with the teachers union um, in response to the guidelines. The initial guidelines that were introduced in late March, um, the negotiation actually occurred between the Department of Education and the state union, the MTA, uh, and the in the AFT. So both state unions agree to the initial guidelines. Um, and then we just have to tr have those conversations locally. But a lot of these conversations are happening district by district because they have to. But a lot of the rules in terms of what's being expected are being set at the state level. So I don't think anything would preclude us from having those conversations once those guidelines are established. Uh, I think this MOA does not does not limit our ability to um to negotiate nor does the moa with the um with the unit a uh group as well so depending on what the state says we need to do um we can have those conversations locally uh, tom i think you and and darren you both want to speak tom go ahead um 
I guess my only comment with respect to that issue is I think it's important to get these things in place, even the, even if they're only short term one year deals. And obviously we can't um, bargain remote learning without knowing what the game plan is going to be and what the ground rules are going to be. So that's that's why we have impact bargaining when things come up and I'm sure we'll deal with that when the time comes. But I think it wouldn't make sense to delay these um, uh, agreements that, uh, that we've been reaching over the past couple of weeks um, in order to wait for the state to come down with some guidelines and then trying to figure where to go from there. I, I think we, we'll have to deal with that when it comes up, but I think it's important to get these in place now. Hey, Darren. Yeah, through the chair, Madam Chair, uh, very quickly. And, you know, as you know, um, when we change, when the, when the school district proposes working conditions, there is a, a bargaining obligation or an impact bargaining obligation that usually needs to take place prior to the change being implemented. However, when a change is necessitated by legal requirements or regulatory requirements, or by exigent circumstances, which I think the pandemic certainly is, unfortunately, um, you have the right to carry forward that bargaining after implementation. So you should fully be able to implement what you need to. There will be some bargaining obligation, but um, if it's required by law or it's an emergency or an exigent circumstance, we can actually do some of that bargaining after we actually implement those, those new working conditions. So you. Long and short, you'll have, you will absolutely, this agreement will not prevent you from being able to implement that at all. Well, Darren, my issue is that um, there are some communities that have negotiated extra time than, than the minimums that the state is requiring. And I want to know if we are in a position where we can negotiate something along those lines, like remote learning time. Yeah. I. I, I think you are, and it would also depend on sort of, I think if it's still less time than being at school, you you have a pretty clear path to be able to do that. So for instance, if it's more time than the, regu the minimum regulatory requirements, it's still a lot less time than being in the classroom, I think you have a clear path to be able to do that. Okay, I, I know the other committee members want to speak and Mr. Isla wants to speak. So uh, I'll stick with the committee first, um, Mrs. Russo? Yeah, I'm all set. All right. Ms. Simon? Um, I appreciate that question that you just asked, uh, Ms. Monaco, um, it is important, but I feel reassured by our answer from Aaron, so thank you. Um, I also just want to say that I'm glad we were able, uh, these contracts that are unfortunately only one year, I just wanted to be sure that if some kind of a raise for the teachers this year. So I'm glad we were able to do this. Mr. Ilo, thank you for uh, waiting. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a quick question on the on the contracts that we've agreed to and the ones that are uh, being looked at now. Is it clear that we're not paying stipends for things that aren't actually happening? I know we had temporarily agreed to that for this current year, but just going forward, is that true? Uh, John, Mr. Eiler, uh, again, I'm sorry through the chair is um, we, we haven't discussed that yet because I'm not sure what's happening in the fall yet. So if um, if uh, there's no fall football season, um, we would certainly uh, put on the table that we wouldn't need to um, support that stipend. I'm just curious, it, it, as a matter of policy, I, I understand everything's ultimately a negotiation, but I, I would think as a matter of policy, that we wouldn't pay stipends for things that aren't happening unless there's, you know, unless we're getting something else in return somehow. It, but I would assume the default is we don't pay that stipend. Is that true or not? Um, I, again, I think <laughs> I, I, I would defer to Darren for that, but all I'm saying is uh, I don't know the answer to that because I don't know uh, what's happening in the fall and what's not happening in the fall. And there's even been some talk, believe it or not, of of moving all of the sports seasons that um, can, where social distancing can occur uh, into the fall, and then maybe push uh, the the spring seasons where the sports where um, there can be more contact if there's a vaccine developed. So, Mr. Eiler, I, I just don't have an answer, but Darren is here, and Darren will come to my rescue, and uh, I'm not sure 
Darren, are we we're not obligated to pay stipends if the if the um, if the activity or the club doesn't happen. Is that correct? Darren, you're muted. You're muted. So, all right, I'll start over. Uh, if if the sports do not happen at all and there's no work put in by the coaches. Um, and I don't have the contract in front of me, but assuming this is the language that obligates you to, then I think you would have a, 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 be able to take that position. But I really do think, like Eric said, it depends on a lot of things. The talk about you know virtual sports of some kind, where there's you know, meetings virtually and and fit, you know we, we really need to say. So I think it's impossible to give a definitive answer right now. But if if nothing happens, there's no con contractual language that binds us, and I don't believe there is. Then I think that's a fair position to take. And I think we need to see what that is. Okay, great. I, I would just, uh, you know, I would say going forward with these contracts before voting on it, I would, it, personally, I would suggest making sure that uh, that it, that it, there isn't anything in there that would ever require us to pay a stipend for something that didn't happen. Uh, okay. Eric, do you have anything else to say on that? I recommend the uh, committee um, adopt. It just gives us budget certainty going into uh, fiscal 21. So um, I recommend the school committee um, adopt the um, unit D MOA. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to um, ratify the 2021 BEA Unit D contract. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Ms. Simon? Aye. Mrs. Russo? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Stay. Mr. Nelson? I'll also abstain. Mrs. Monaco votes aye. It's 3 0 uh, 2. Okay, um, do you want to go back to the facilities update, Eric? You well, everyone, and good luck with the rest of your meeting. Hey, okay, Darren. thanks, Darren. Nice to see you. Hey, Darren. Stay safe and healthy. You too. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, again, Madam Chair, uh, we will turn it over to um, Bob. He can let us know the latest with the uh, flood damage at the high school and some of the other projects that are going on. and. Um, and where we're at, so Bob. Thank you to the chair. So um, I was hoping to have more information in regards to the flood, um, but that did not work in my favor today. Um, so what did happen is, is I met with the third party adjuster. Um, we exchanged uh, obviously information toward the building, um, exchanged pictures, and um, then there was a follow-up meeting uh, last week and then a second follow-up meeting with um, the damage control company service master that came in as well too. So um, those two follow-up meetings has delayed the information getting to my hands, um, but I'm expecting that relatively shortly. Um, I think there's no question at all, um, certain things that are damaged, uh, including the wood floor, um, certain ceiling tiles, things like that. Um, but again, I think until we have some finalized numbers, I don't want to uh, guarantee or even speculate like what that is. Um, as for projects going on, um, you know, we do need to maintain social distancing and obviously um, we can't have full forces uh, into some of our projects. So they're going at a slower pace, um, but we are working on the construction in the Pine Glen building, which is a warrant article from this year. No. Uh, putting, um, I'm sorry, was there a question? No. Oh, so again, so in the Pine Glen room, um, doing the addition over there. Uh, today, we had crews in the auditorium um, working on the ceiling at the high school today. Um, we are doing plumbing projects. Um, we have not been able to get in custodial-wise yet and start working on our floors and things like that, but I think in the next coming weeks, we'll have some decisions and answers on that as well. Um, I gave the update at our last meeting that the Francis Wyman projects regarding the air conditioning and the fire alarm um, we're mostly done with just a few punch list items. Um, again, most of those punch list items have been cleaned up. Uh, there are still a few outstanding items on those punch lists. 
uh, but we're, we're extremely close to being done with both of those projects. So uh, I think our next steps will pertain to, again, getting uh, teachers in and staff, uh, custodial staff into the buildings um, so we can do some cleaning of some of the, the classrooms before we really break them down and start our, our actual big summer projects. Okay, any uh, discussion? First, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, Bob, um, on, the, on, the, on the high school gym floor, um, assuming that the uh, insurance adjusters and whatnot get their act together, uh, is, would you, you anticipate having that repaired or replaced by the start of school? Is that possible or is that unlikely? I, I'm hearing two different trains of thoughts on that. Um, right now, we do have some in the marketplace is good for getting work done. Um, but I think as uh, some restrictions are lifted and we see more services come back into play, um, I think that some of these companies that provide these services are going to be uh, a little bit more busy. Um, so right now, since we're not really able to lock that down officially, it looks good, I would say. Uh, but I think the longer this goes on, um, we may run into difficulties having it ready, let's say, for a start date of September 1 for school. Okay, um, and again, who knows what school is going to look like in the fall, but best case scenario, sporting teams and sporting events that do use the gym, uh, we'll just have to keep that an eye on that, I, I, I assume, and have a backup plan. For instance, the, I think the volleyball teams play in the gym in the fall, right. uh, and I'm sure others make use of it, so it, it's just kind of something I'm sure you got it in the back of your mind, but just to let people know that we are... Mm -hmm going to be planning for that in the event this thing doesn't come together on time. Yes, thank you. And Madam Chair, more importantly than that, that's the Vanilla Gymnasium, and we don't want Mr. Vanilla upset with us. I don't want him upset with me. <laughs> that's an excellent point. Chris, I have a question. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you. Um, Bob, was there any damage to the rubber gym? Um, no, there is not. Okay, so at least we have some area where we can we can carry on classes if we need to. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So the rubber gym is is fully functional. Uh, other question, Eric. In in years past, if it rained out on graduation day, we would move everything indoors to the wooden gym. Um, what do we do this year if it rains on June seventh? I think Mark has a rain plan that involves the um, auditorium, where because we're only going to be seeing one family at a time. So they would drive up, they would walk through the auditorium in one door and then out the other. Okay. And they would get a, a picture on the stage with their family and uh, and move on. So uh, he has an indoor plan and, and an outdoor plan. Outdoor plan is always easier, but uh, he has both. Okay, that's good, thank you. Okay, Martha. Um, a couple questions. So going back, Bob, to the uh, Francis Wyman and the Pine Glen projects, it, it sounds like the Francis Twyman projects are almost fun, done, but could you just give us the final when it is all the punch list items are done? I'd appreciate that. Um, and I don't know exactly which stage the pine is at, but likewise the updates as, as it gets completed. Um, and in terms of the uh, high school flood, I, I do want to raise two issues. One is um, this is part of our HVAC problem and it's part of our need for renovation at the high school. And um, I would like if you or whoever is appropriate could make us a list of all the failures of the building and the systems in the building that are the reason why we need a renovation at the high school, not just the HVAC, but um, it certainly is focused on the HVAC system. Because um, I, I, I thought of three the other day, but we got the flood now. We had the day when Governor Baker brought everyone and there was no air conditioning. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we've had a number of other events that were failures of the HVAC system at the high school. And I would like us to make sure we have a, a compiled list as we move forward talking about what is going to happen at the high school. Um, mm -hmm. And the other part is that I'm hoping that our capital warrant article of $100,000 for design for this coming upcoming year will be uh, engaging with CBI, our new, uh, is that right, CBI, our new architectural firm, um, to immediately start looking at the high school and looking at 
because the uh, capital warrant article that was approved by town meeting last year is specifically for the HVAC system, but I would want to be sure that they're looking at the whole building at, in terms of what makes the most sense. If we're gonna you know, tear up all the ceilings um, and all the, the wiring because of the HVAC, then I want us to be looking at a whole plan and, and how it looks. So that's my request. Thank you. Kristen, do you have anything? Kristen? I just have a question. Were any of the locker rooms or any other areas damaged that need substantial repair? Um, so again, through the chair, so as far as substantial repairs to specific rooms, uh, besides the wooden gym, the hallway upstairs by the athletics office, um, no substantial structural damage or, or um, in place items. But what did get damaged was um, equipment that was on the floor, let's say in the girls' locker room, um, the wrestling mat, um, and the concussion mat in the wrestling room. Uh, so some, some, again, some furniture that was on the floor, things like that. But structural damage, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does anyone else have any input on this particular item? Chris, if I may, there's a question that came in through the chat. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if you want me to read it or just discuss it, but basically it's asking why is the water not shut off at the time of the burst? Um, and that is a very good question. Um, what we do is like typically most houses do is we look at what the upcoming forecast is, of course, and then predict that. Um, but unlike a house, we have such large spaces um, that we typically can't shut it off, you know, that early. That particular week, um, Nicole and I were discussing this as well too, ironically, um, two days before there was a 33 degree night and the day before there was a 33 degree night, uh, which again is not freezing, but of course we don't take those, you know, chances. Um, the second part to that question too is uh, with the older design of the building, um, you have such large circulation loops of hot water that you can't necessarily just shut off you know, let's say one unit or one classroom or whatnot, you have to shut off whole loops um, that may include, let's say, showers or sinks or things like that as well, too. So, you know, I think in a newer building, you have uh, more luxuries, you know, to isolate areas. Um, but when you get into some of these older buildings, like I said, I think you're limited into like the capacity of what you can shut down and isolate. So and hopefully that answers that question, but I'd be willing to obviously answer more questions if need be. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um if there's nothing else on that particular item, I'll, I would like to um, go back to the other ratification and then we can do the varsity field. Is that okay? Eric? All good. All right, so how about we do the uh, BSAA? The last unit we had are the uh, Burlington um, Administrative um, Association and that's, um, some of our 12 month um, administrators uh, that are not on individual contracts. So that would be um, uh, director of guidance, uh, athletic director, um, preschool director, um, uh, our associate principals at the high school. So it's a relatively small unit. And uh, again, we just want to do a one year, uh, two and a half percent COLA for budget certainty with no changes in working conditions. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Um, Martha Simon, I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved by Kristen and seconded by Martha. Are there any uh, questions or comments on the BSAA uh, contract? Okay, hearing none, I will put it to a vote. All those in favor, Ms. Simon. Aye. Russo. Aye. Mr. Murphy. Abstain. Uh, what was that, Tom? Abstain. Okay, uh, Mr. Nelson? Abstain. Mrs. Monaco votes aye. That's three zero two. All right, and we have one item left, and that's the reduction of uh, BHS Varsity Field Warrant Article for the June town meeting. Are we, uh, are we gonna postpone that, or how are we gonna approach this, Eric? Um, Madam Chair, again, I, I would defer to the committee in terms of the rules that you would like to follow. 
um, we were asked to make um, a reduction uh, to our capital warrant request to free up some um, free cash. So the original capital warrants that you all approved were within the original budget that was given to us, um, which was, I think, and Bob, correct me, $1.6 um, million. Um, they asked us to um, um, contribute 50% of a million dollar reduction to warrant article requests. And our recommendation was the uh, half million dollar varsity field project. Um, and so that was the recommendation that we made. I think we made it almost a month ago. I think the school committee, you were very supportive of that. Um, I think that reduction was also um, discussed at the full ways and means committee as well. And um, I think we're just looping back to um, inform the committee. I think there was some conversation about pulling it um, at town meeting floor, but um, my, my understanding, again, from Ways and Means, and I think Mr. Eilers here, I thought I saw um, Ms. Ms. Harrigan as well, that Ways and Means was looking for the reduction uh, ahead of town meeting. So um, um, I think it's all a matter of timing now. You've all been discussing this for three or four weeks. I think the committee was very amenable to uh, working with the town and contributing, um, delaying this project, again, not canceling this project, um, delaying it to a, a later date when, um, when um, I think funding is more certain. And so I, I think um, that's why it's back in the school committee agenda. But um, honestly, if through you, if we could ask uh, Ms. Harrigan or Mr. Eiler to, to comment, um, whether it's pulled at town meeting or you vote to not move it forward now, um, I think everyone's intention for several weeks has been um, to delay this project until we know more about what's going on um, with the town's finances. My, orig my original understanding was that uh, we would postpone it. I thought Paul Sagarino wanted things postponed till January, but maybe you can just withdraw it and bring it back in January. Um, Susan Harrigan, do you have? Yeah, I believe that that, that is the uh, thought is that we were gonna postpone these uh, projects and they would reassess the cash situation and everything else. Um, obviously, it's not just this, it's the, not, another half a million on the town side, too, that they're just postponing these articles. And we'll, once we know our financial position, tax revenue and all that, um, they will maybe bring some of these back in January. So it's a postponement, basically. So should we vote to uh, withdraw it or should we vote to postpone till January? I, I think postpone, because I, I do believe they do want to have the opportunity to readdress these um, you know, later in the year. Okay. I'd, I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead, Martha. We postpone um, article, uh, capital warrant article 2103, the varsity field turf replacement for $500,000 and that we postpone it until, uh, do we wanna be specific about which town meeting? The January 21 town meeting uh, for further consideration. <laughs> Okay, is there discussion on this? Uh, I got something. Go ahead, uh, Tom. Uh, just to reinforce uh, what we talked about, uh, I think it was probably three, two or three meetings ago when we first talked about this. And I know there was some comment when, the, um, when it was first brought up about the optics weren't good about spending that kind of money on, on a playing field with everything that's going on in the world right now. And, well, I don't necessarily disagree with that, obviously, and I support the motion. I do want to reinforce the fact that this is a valuable asset that, we, that the town bought 10 years ago when we do have a, um, a fiduciary obligation to maintain it. So, um, well, I think withdrawing it as, or postponing it as as has been moved is makes sense uh, as we work with the town to get through all of this stuff. I don't want this to fall between the cracks, and I know that's not our intention, and clearly the town anticipates this coming back forward in January, and we'll talk about it then, but it's, uh, I, 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 uh, <clears throat> the, the comment that it was kind of bad optics, uh, to me kind of makes it sound like it's a luxury to have a nice playing field, and this was a very expensive field, and we do have the, yeah, the duty to, to maintain it. So um, I'll support the motion, and I look forward to the discussion as we, Approach January as to when they're going to start um, addressing some of the projects that were postponed, because this is important. This is an important thing that we have to do, and I 
want to make sure we don't delay it to the point where it's going to cost us a lot more to refurbish it. Okay, anyone else? Martha? Um, I support what Mr. Murphy says in terms of making sure we maintain this important asset, but I also know that it's not getting the use that it would typically get in this coming year. And so I feel comfortable postponing it um, and to support the motion. Thank you. Um, I, I have one comment, Chris. He, yes, Steve. I, I just wanted to um, support what Mr. Murphy said and also point out that it's really a, a, a two-stage process. The, the track needs to be refurbished and the turf field needs to be replaced. And we can't do the track until we do the turf field. So it, it wouldn't be prudent for us to postpone indefinitely the turf field because the, I don't think the rubber track is going to be a safe track to be used, uh, you know, in the near future. So we got we got to get these projects done, and um, as Tom said, we have an obligation to maintain that field, and it's it's you it may not be used uh, a lot right now, but uh, I, I suspect by next spring it's going to be back. Uh, to be used very heavily, not just by the students, but by most of the community as well. Okay, Kristen, do you have anything? No, I just want to echo what's been said. So, thank you. Okay, so we'll put the motion to a, um, a vote, and the motion is to postpone the um, replacement of the varsity field postpone the Warren article until the January town meeting in 2021. All those in favor, Ms. Simon. Aye. Mrs. Russo. Aye. Mr. Murphy. Aye. Mr. Nelson. Aye. Chairman Christine Monica votes aye. So that's five zero zero. Um, Kristen, I have, I, I neglected earlier on when we were talking to you I neglected to tell you that um, Megan Nowicek, I didn't, I said it fast, so I wouldn't say it too far wrong. Um, she's uh, the CPAC co-president and she wanted to tell you, thank you and you will be missed. And I think we all agree thank with you. that sentiment. Thank you. <laughs> we do. It's a pleasure. All right, is there anything else to come before the committee? If not, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Kristen, you want to make it? Yes, <laughs> a motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Mrs. Russo. I thank you. Simon. My pleasure. Hey, thank you, Kristen. Mr. Mur Mr. Murphy. Hi, and I also want to add my thanks to Kristen. Uh, we'll miss you, and I'm sure you'll still be around. So, I, I, yes, I will. Mr. Nelson. Uh, I would like to also thank Kristen, uh, serving on the committee. What was it, nine years, Kristen? Mm -hmm. A lot yes. of dedication goes into this job, and uh, I, I want to thank you. You did a great job. And uh, best wishes going forward, and I support the motion to adjourn. And Thank you, Kristen. We really will miss you. Stick around as much as you can. And I will die. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night, Good night everybody. Everybody, Good night. Good night, John. When are we going to get to go out and have that drink, Kristen? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. You know, wait for the. Uh... Government to say it's okay, Mr. Governor. Well, we you get there. Take care of yourself, all right? Thank you, you too. Greatly appreciated. Thank you, too. Bye.